Hello everyone and welcome back to our bariatric support group. Uh, I'm excited to have you with us this week for our very special conversation with one of our surgeons, um, Dr. Ellen Shirk. Dr. Shirk is a, a clinical professor of surgery and sees patients at the Penn Medicine Washington Square location and the Penn Medicine Cherry Hill location for outpatient um, visits and then operates at the Pennsylvania Hospital at 8th and Spruce. So we are excited to have him with us tonight and I'll turn things over to uh, Dr. Shark to say hi to the group for today. Good evening everybody. Welcome to the session. Uh, hopefully we'll have a nice active interaction between everybody. I'm open to just about any question but Colleen does have some editorial control over what makes it onto the discussion screen. Yes. All right. So on that note, that's a fantastic transition for us here, Dr. Shirk, and that you have two different ways of interacting with each other here. Uh, if you see a comment that you would like to say, I see you, there's a little thumbs up like button next to someone else's comment. Feel free to utilize that and to, to like each other's posts. I also have editorial control, so I'm able to help uh, navigate and make sure that we're, we're keeping things relative relatively confidential. Uh, we can't always keep everything completely anonymous if you're sharing your names and certain information, but we can at least keep it confidential. All right, so uh, we have a few different people here that are introducing themselves and we'd love to see you here um, who are individuals who are patients of Dr. Shirk, including Ellen. Uh, hi, Ellen, you had the sleeve with Dr. Shirk in July. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, so first question for Dr. Shirk we have from Carl. What is the most important thing I should do before surgery? Carl, that's a very good question. What we have to recognize is that surgery is no magic bullet. It's not going to make you lose weight for more than about three or four months. During that time, there will be an obligatory weight loss, whether you do things properly or not. But then after about three or four months and for the rest of your life, your success or failure will be predicated completely on how well you follow the diet, exercise regularly, come back for regular visits, take accountability for your actions and are welcome and open to suggestions and criticisms. What we need you to do going forward is no different than what you did when you're younger and got your learner's permit before you went for your driver's test. And that is practice the life skills and the life changing habits that you're going to have to do for the rest of your life. This is the time for trial and error. This is the time where you can make adjustments but you really start to need to start living the lifestyle now because you're gonna to have to do it for the rest of your life anyway. Also, if you lose a little weight before surgery, it makes the job of the surgeons easier. And if our job is easier, then your recovery is easier. So anything you can do beforehand to get yourself ready mentally and emotionally and physically will make the whole process easier for you. Yeah, excellent. And like the dietitians like to say, that medical weight management is your period of preparation, right? Uh, it's your time to... I could have said it a lot quicker that way. <laughs> yeah, and well, still, nonetheless, we have a lot of isms. We like to say that our surgeons only operate on stomachs, not brains. So we're here to help you figure out how to do all of these changes, not just the what's. All right, so uh, we have a question from an, um, a, someone who labeled their name in the, the comments. Uh, Robin uh, has their final appointment in January. Just wanted to know how long they can expect to be in the hospital after surgery. Um, that's a good question. And I'm gonna give you an answer that's not gonna be to your liking because I don't know. Um, your length of stay in the hospital would depend on who your surgeon is, what day of the week your surgery is, what hospital you're having it done, and what operation you're having done. For, for the great majority of patients, the hospital stay is somewhere between one night and two nights, unless there are issues such as pain control or nausea or your sugars are a little bit out of whack and we need to make some adjustments. But for the most part, it's usually one night in the hospital. Okay, excellent. Uh and always something good to talk to your care team about. It may be different for everybody, but that's that's the expectation. Always good to communicate with us. Uh, all right, so we have a pretty tough question here, but COVID related, it's timely, Dr. Shirk. Let's yes. see um, what your, your advice here is for Debbie. So Debbie had surgery with Dr. Wernsing uh, last year. 
since COVID has had no contact with the team and doesn't feel like she's in a good place, uh, is really struggling with weight regain at this point. Do you have any suggestions or comments for Debbie? Yeah, Debbie, that's that's a bad place to be. But the important thing is you realize you're in a bad place and if you want help, help is available. Um, as we go through the process under normal circumstances, the further along you get after surgery, the appointments get spread out further and further because as you mature through the diet progression and get further out, most of the problems are taken care of and most patients go on to autopilot. But most patients is not all patients. If you're having trouble, the easiest thing to do since you're a patient, Dr. Wernsings, is reach out to Linda or to Kristen, his nurse practitioner, or to Dr. Wernsing through my pen medicine or with a phone call, and we can arrange a follow-up. COVID has been a mixed blessing for all of us. One of the things it's done is it's changed our life and turned everything upside down. But for the bariatric program, I'm sure Colleen will agree, what it's allowed us to do is make it much more convenient for most patients because every encounter doesn't require coming into the city, paying for parking, sitting in a waiting room, going into an exam room. And I think telemedicine has made it easier for everybody. And most of the things that we need to do before and after surgery can be handled by telemedicine. However, if you want to be seen in person or you need to be seen in person, those arrangements can be made. But the thing is, is don't think that because they told you a couple months ago that your next appointment's in a year, it has to be a year. When we make the recommendations for appointments, it's a suggestion. If you need to be seen more frequently than every three months, six months, or 12 months, we will see you as often as we have to to get you where you need to be. Excellent. Yes. Um, of course, I'm going to keep on throwing in these isms because I hope that they ring in your head when you feel like you're struggling. Don't guess, don't Google, reach out. That's what we're here for. Uh, we have the whole team of dietitians, and as Margaret Ann has pointed out, Linda is phenomenal. Uh, we're here to, to help you with whatever whatever you need, and we're more accessible than ever. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's stick with some of the surgery questions, and then we will come back to some of the longer term questions that we're seeing here. Okay, so we have from Taisha, how soon she's going to have surgery in uh, 2021. After surgery, can she expect drainage bulbs or just stitches or like what is she going to be looking at when she wakes up from surgery? Once again, I can't answer that question because it depends on the operation, the hospital, and who your surgeon is. But for the most part, we don't use drain tubes. So un unless there's an issue intraoperatively, we're using a drainage tube and a, and a bulb would be to your benefit and your safety. You can anticipate not having a drainage tube for most of the surgeons and most of the operations. Uh, for the most part, all the incisions are closed with stitches that dissolve. Some people use the butterfly bandages and band-aids. Some of us use skin glue on top of that, but you shouldn't have staples or stitches that need to come out. Oh, great. Excellent. Yes, a lot of this will be uh, talk to your team. That is what we're here for. Uh, and always feel free to my pen medicine message us with any questions as well. Okay, so let's see here. We have a few questions about long-term weight regain. So I, I'll preface this with, um, you have a dietitian here with you, Dr. Shirk. So if you have anything that you also want me to add in, I'm here for it. Uh, so we have an anonymous question, 22 months out from a sleeve gastrectomy. Is there weight, if there is weight regain and the new stomach stretches, can it return back to its post-operative size? Once again, my same stock answer, it depends on the operation. For the most part, we do see some stretching of the stomach pouch after a gastric bypass. The sleeve, we don't see much in the way of stretching. I know there's a lot of stuff online and out there on the viral interweb, which is not well regulated, about doing a reset diet where you go back to phase one and go back to liquids, and the hope is if you go back to a liquid diet for a period of time, the stomach does shrink a little bit. That being said, 95, probably closer to 99% of people who gain weight after success, after surgery, are not gaining weight because their stomach is bigger. 
they're just eating more because their diet is off. And it has more to do with behavior than it has to do with anatomy. And, and I'll have Colleen interject in a second, but the key is getting refocused. And what we, we suggest you do is call the office and, and, and get an appointment made. But what's very helpful, especially when you're interacting with the dietitians, is for a couple of weeks before your appointment, keep an accurate food journal. Everything you eat, quantity, quality, how many calories, track grams of protein and carbs and sugars, because what we tend to do is we don't realize what we're putting in our mouths and in our bodies until we actually start writing it down. And a lot of the mistakes you're making will become self-evident when, when you start to log these things. But then when you meet with a dietitian, they have something concrete they can go over with, and they're not talking concepts, they're talking specifics. All right, excellent. Yes, and I 100% um, agree from a, a dietitian standpoint as well, uh, and also from a, an evidence-based standpoint, especially with the sleep gastrectomy. Stretching is not something that is really commonly seen where it really stretches out to the point that someone can eat a large volume of food in one sitting. What's much more common and one, one of the largest studies we have out of Sweden looking at five and 10 year weight losses at six months out, actually grazing is one of the strongest dietary pattern predictors of someone regaining weight over time. So that's just picking at food throughout the day. And it makes sense when you think about it. If you can only eat about a cup of food in a sitting, over about 45 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, and it takes an hour for that to empty out your stomach, you can eat a cup of food every hour, just spaced out, right? And never really feel full or satisfied and be able to eat a large volume of food uh, over an extended period of time. So watching out for those behaviors and talking to your dietitian uh, and working through some of those challenges, but exactly not one of the things we would typically expect. Stretching is, is pretty rare. The um, other thing is a, yes. lot has, a, lot, a lot has to do with what you eat. If you eat a meal that's heavy in protein, which is what you're supposed to be eating, or heavy in fat, that food will stay in your stomach longer and you'll feel full longer and be less likely to go back to the refrigerator that much more quickly. Carbs leave our stomachs very quickly. So a meal that's heavy in carbs will empty out of our stomach much more readily, and then your stomach will be empty and ready for more food. And with carbs, you'll have that hunger drive come back and you'll be eating more, not more with each meal, like Colleen said, but you'll be just eating more over the course of 24 hours. Yeah. And uh, so we have along those lines, let's talk a little bit about this. And I'm going to preface this with I, I will adjust to whatever your preferred phrasing is uh, here as as a patient. But Stephanie is asking, is it normal to still have cheat days every week and really fluctuate with weight loss after surgery? So I can talk a little bit about the evidence base here, but I, I want to give you a chance to uh, yeah. answer Stephanie's question here, Dr. Sher. No one's going to be perfect 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 352 weeks a year. You just can't do it. Um, if you get it right and get it near perfect, most of the time you're going to be okay. One of my favorite sayings, and I've been using it for 20 years, is that the sins in the kitchen can be absolved in the gymnasium. If you, do, if you have a bad day, if you have a bad meal and you exercise a little bit more, you can give back and burn off those extra calories. That being said, no matter how much exercise you do, it will not be a substitute for bad eating habits on a regular basis. So I wouldn't mark your calendar and on the fifth of every month, that's your cheat day. But every once in a while, it's normal behavior to have an off meal or a couple off meals every once in a while. No one's expecting you to go to your best friends or your daughter's or your niece's wedding and not just have a little sliver of birthday cake, but you can't have a piece of cake just because it's Tuesday. Yeah, so uh, and the evidence base, the, the research that we have actually backs this up that if uh, that those who have more of a um, controlled eating pattern for five days a week and are more lax typically on the weekends for two days in terms of how much they're eating are more likely to lose more weight 
long term and then also more likely to keep it off. It gives you a little bit of flexibility. I push back a little bit on using the term cheat because that implies um, uh, that there's a right or a wrong way of doing this and brings morals into it, right? It's really a high calorie day or a low calorie day, right? Um, there are no such things as good days when it comes to, to food at least, right? There are no such things as good days, bad days, um, right days, wrong days. It's high calorie day, low calorie day. I met my goal, I didn't meet my goal. So bringing those emotions emotions into it when you're doing self-assessment is is definitely a rabbit hole that we want to try and avoid. Uh, so I would strongly encourage you, Stephanie, um, we like to say, say what you mean, right? Uh, a high calorie day and having those days on the weekends, wonderful. Um, and Dr. Shirk, to your one point, I, I really want to highlight here is that higher levels of physical activity have actually been shown to help. Um, what's the best way of putting this? Um, push off, I guess, excess weight gain. Uh, that when someone's more active, their body's able to adapt to higher calorie days without taking on more weight. Uh, so one of the benefits of physical activity, actually one of the strongest benefits of physical activity, is that it helps prevent weight gain over time, especially if you have those higher calorie days. We like to say people lose weight in the kitchen, they keep it off on the sidewalk, right? You need both components. They both play their roles, uh, but they're very separate and different roles. So uh, absolutely right. You wanna make sure that you have both of those and that may actually be able to help you with keeping off some excess weight gain if you did have a higher calorie day. So I love it, I love it. Um, all right, so let's uh, shift over here to anonymous. Uh, we have if you reach a weight nadir post-surgery but and then you have weight regain right so you for those of you who don't know what nadir is it's your lowest weight point uh and you have weight regain can you re-lose the weight to reattain one's nadir can you keep on going after the first effect of the surgery dr shirt i think you can um the, the key what we have to set and this is one of the things about doing bariatric surgeon you have to be not only a surgeon but you have to be a bit of a psychologist and, and a coach as well, we have to look at what your goal weight is. And your goal weight should never be what it says on insurance tables or charts. Your goal weight has to be two things. It has to be attainable. You have to be able to get there and it has to be sustainable. You have to be able to stay there. So if you pick a weight that is just ridiculously over enthusiastic and unreachable, you're going to set yourself up for failure, but it, everybody is going to have a little bit of regain after a nadir. That's just the, the general experience we've had with bariatric surgery for over 50 years. The key is what I want people to do when they're out from surgery is I want them to look at the scale and I want them to come up with two, two weights. One is how much weight do I regain before I say I have to fix this? And when you hit that number, you kick into self-preservation mode. And the second number is, what is that number that says, I'm in over my head, I need to ask for help. And those two numbers should not be more than five and 10 pounds. When you regain five pounds or put on five pounds, that should be a signal that you need to do something different because you're going in the wrong direction. And if you regain 10, we need to see you as soon as possible. Right, excellent. And then we also have from Shirley here, and I love that we talk about um, uh, yellow light, green light, red light um, uh, numbers and having those in your head every time that you weigh yourself so that you you know when you need to, to reach out. Love it. Um, so we have from Shirley here, when can she take ibuprofen again? Depends on the operation. Um, after a gastric bypass, the general answer is never. But after a sleeve, we want to wait at least three months until you're back on a regular diet, you're eating consistently, and we know that that non-steroidal is not gonna sit in your stomach and do what non-steroidals do, which is break down the barriers against acid inside your stomach, because that can set you up for inflammation, gastritis, and ulcer formation, which is much more critical after gastric bypass than it is after sleep. If we have issues where you need to be on those medications, there are a group of non-steroidals called COX-2 anti-inflammatories, which is Mobic and Celebrex, which don't have as much risk for stomach irritation as ibuprofen or Aleve or Naproxen do. But the general rule of thumb is about three months for sleeves and never for gastric bypass. All right, excellent. So 
Uh, we have a couple of quick dietary questions here that I'm, I'm going to answer uh, from the dietitian's perspective real quick. Um, so how soon can you have fruit after surgery? Uh, frankly, once you're at about four weeks out, try it out. It's all about texture. So you want to start off with really easy to eat fruits, but getting your protein first. So if you're able to eat, consume your protein and you have a little bit of additional room, try out a little bit of a fruit as a side. So good starting sides are going to be like soft smashable uh, cocktail peaches or pears in their own juice, bananas, um, anything along those lines. If you can smash it with a fork, you're probably okay. Uh, if it has a tough skin or a lot of seeds in it, probably not just yet. It's a little too tough for your stomach to handle. Uh, but yeah, as soon as you want to, uh, as soon as you feel comfortable and you start off with a really soft texture, go for it. But if you aren't sure, again, don't guess, don't Google, reach out to us, talk to a dietitian and we'll talk about it. So we also have a question about separating eating and drinking and uh, how long that needs to be practiced long term. So when it comes to eating and drinking at the same time, for some people it makes them feel nauseous uh, and some people it makes them vomit. But what we're really concerned about in the long term is that certain case studies have actually shown that after a sleep gastrectomy long term, liquids are going to empty out of your stomach faster than solids. And when you mix solids and liquids as well, it also empties out faster. So the thought being and the concern being that if you are to drink and eat at the same time, that meal is going to empty out of your stomach faster than it would have had you not eaten and drink, drank at the same time. Now this is completely different if you've never had surgery before. This is specific to a sleeve gastrectomy and also a gastric bypass. Uh, so the thought being that you may find that you are hungrier faster after eating and drinking at the same time long term. So that could be a potential area that uh, could be a little bit challenging in terms of volume and how many calories you're getting in long term. So again, pick up the phone, call a dietitian. That's what we're here for. That's going to be my answer for many different things here. Uh, all right, so we have questions um, from Jessica. Let's go back to surgery itself. She's worried about permanent scarring after the surgery. Can you comment at all at what patients can expect for a laparoscopic surgery and scarring? Um, once again, probably across the entire health system, more than 99% of the bariatric surgery is done minimally inversely minimally invasively, which is either laparoscopically or with the robot assistance. And in that situation, all the scars are going to be very small, ranging in size from a quarter inch to a little bit bigger than an inch. We'd usually do those transversely across the abdomen so they heal into the natural skin folds. And if you're a good healer, they're usually insignificant once they heal completely. Even incisions that open up after surgery, once they heal, the scarring is usually insignificant. As far as scarring internally, surprisingly, even with the complexity of a bariatric procedure, the amount of intra-abdominal internal scarring or adhesions, as they're called, is actually pretty minimal and surprisingly inconsequential. All right, excellent. Um, so we have a few questions here about uh, having small children in the house and uh, having surgery or looking to get pregnant for after surgery and what considerations people should, should take into account. Do you have any comments? Let's start off with pregnancy after okay. bariatric surgery. It's, a, it's an issue because as women lose weight after surgery, they become more fertile on numerous levels. One is the weight loss actually changes the, rel changes the relative concentration of your body in, of female hormones and male hormones, so women become more susceptible to pregnancy. Also, as you lose weight, the physical barriers to, to successful conception go down. And the third is, as you lose weight, your self-esteem goes up and you're more likely to engage in such behaviors that would lead to a pregnancy. And for all these reasons, it's much easier to get pregnancy as you start to lose weight than before surgery. That being said, we really encourage women waiting at least a year and a half before they get pregnant. And there's two reasons for it. Certainly early on, your caloric intake and your nutritional needs are, are, are just barely being met. And it's sometimes difficult to take on 
the added nutritional burden of a developing. But the, the biggest reason is during that initial time, that's when you're losing weight at the highest rate. And that's the time for you to be selfish. You want to try to lose as much weight as you can. You want to try to get as much exercise as you can. And you, to undergo a pregnancy with all the physical and hormonal changes, it makes it very hard for you to be as successful as you can. Does it happen? Yes, sometimes it happens. And we've had several women in, our, in my practice who have gotten pregnant within the first year. They've all delivered healthy babies, anecdotally, probably a little bit lower in birth weight than they would have been if they weren't going through the bariatric process. But the important thing is, is we can't rely on, I haven't been able to get pregnant, I won't be able to get pregnant. And most women should go on some sort of contraception that's more reliable than hopes and prayers after bariatric surgery. Yeah, and I I will add to that. There was a recent study that was published showing that sperm health actually improves with weight loss after bariatric surgery. So men, we're not going to leave you out of this. Uh, there's also some reproductive health benefits potentially for, for you know, with weight loss as well. Um, so we also had questions around having small children in the house and um, uh, having surgery. So I see a few of you uh, responding with your experiences. I love it. Continue to keep those coming and, and give some uh, feedback around that. One thing that I will suggest is to, to be aware that we don't want you lifting your, your kids for the first few weeks out from surgery, especially. So that's one of the things that we get most concerned about are um, mindlessly bending down to pick up your toddler um, and, and lifting any one or anything more than 10 pounds initially oh. out the gate. So making sure you have help for that. Yeah. And as a surgeon, I'm going to disagree with the, new, with, with the dietitian and Colleen. That, uh -oh. <laughs> um, what we have to recognize is most of the restrictions we put, and this is, this is confession for first surgeon, most of the restrictions we put on patients are more stringent than they need to be because we know most patients are going to cheat and cut corners a little bit anyway. But that being said, what we have to look at is the mechanics of what you're going to pick up. If you're going to pick up your child who weighs 20 or 25 pounds and you're going to hold that child close to you, it's not stressful on your core. Your, your center of gravity does in shift and you can very comfortably walk around and carry a baby. Now, bending over into a playpen or into the crib to lift a baby out may be more problematic, but it's much less stress on your body to carry a 25 pound baby than a 15 pound box that's big and bulky that you're leaning forward to pick up and carry. That being said is we're always cautious that you're gonna rip open one of your incisions or more significantly rupture a staple line or a suture line internally, it's highly unlikely that picking up a 15, 20, 25 pound baby is gonna do any significant damage. If you wanna pick up your, your two year old who weighs 35 pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, now we're into a different situation. But if you, I tell all my patients, regardless of the operation, when you go home, be mom. Don't neglect your kids. Don't avoid contact with your kids. They need your love. They need your affection. And do what you need to do to be mom. Right, excellent. And I um, am here for it. That's really uh, important to keep in mind. And I will integrate in mechanics uh, from here on out and making sure that you're not engaging your core with those discussions. Absolutely. All right, so let's shift over. And there are a few questions here um, for longer term. So let's shift over to those. Uh, so we have, uh, what impact does exercise have on weight? And what do you recommend after surgery, strength or cardio? I have the, the dietitian answer to this and we touched on it briefly, but I'll, I'll let you start this one off, Dr. Shirt. Yes, both. Um, we want to do as much exercise as we can because <laughs> exercise does a couple things. It burns more calories, it adds muscle mass, which burns more calories, and it increases your metabolism. But you want it to be a balance. I look at the two things, strength training, lifting weights, Pilates resistance training, and cardio or aerobics, which is treadmill, bike, elliptical, running, things like that, as completely different things. When you do cardio, you can burn a lot of calories. And with a heavy cardio workout, you can burn upwards of three, four, five, six hundred calories in an hour. But for the most part, within 15, 20 minutes of recovery after that, after your exercise, 
your metabolism comes back to baseline again. So cardio is like your paycheck. You get it, you spend it, it's gone. Strength training, on the other hand, where you actually build muscle mass, is more like your 401k or your retirement plan. You're not going to burn a lot of calories while you're lifting weights or doing resistance training, but for every pound of muscle you add, it's going to burn 50 to 70 calories a day, regardless of what you do. So you're not going to see the benefit in the short term, but just like your 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 retirement plan, which is compounding interest on a regular basis, it pays dividends down the road. So you want to balance between cardio for the calorie burn and strength training for the muscle mass and the long-term sustainable calorie burn. Plus, one of my patients said it best that one of the support groups when we used to be face-to-face, they said, your skin gets loose as you lose fat. If you can add muscle to fill up some of that void, the saggy skin won't be as obvious. So anything you can do to increase the fill of, of that loose skin will be beneficial from a cosmetic point of view. Yeah, absolutely. I I will modify slightly on this because it depends on where you're at in the process, right? So um, I um, it depends on if you're right out from surgery or long term as to what we'll end up talking about for behaviorally. So immediately after surgery for the, about the first six to 12 months out um, when you're losing weight, it's actually very difficult to maintain or gain muscle while losing weight quickly. Up to a third of every pound you lose can be lean body mass, especially when you're losing weight quickly right out from surgery. So if you've seen people that have lost weight almost too quickly and have that sunken in, caved in, almost sickly type of look, that's usually a sign that someone's lost a lot of muscle mass as they're losing weight. So what Dr. Shirk said is key, that muscle um, strengthening and having some form of weight bearing exercise is going to be key for two different reasons. One is it's going to help you maintain the muscle that you have as much as possible possible and mainly lose fat tissue, not muscle as you go. Uh, but two, it'll also help you hold on to bone mass as you lose weight as well. That um, weight bearing exercise, anything that puts stress on your bones, that's going to be important as you're comfortable doing that. Um, the cardio is also going to be really important from a cardiovascular standpoint. But once you get to weight and maintenance, that physical activity, exactly what Dr. Shirk is talking about, if you don't have the muscle to hold up your excess skin, it's going to appear that much more saggy. Right. Um, but also with that, that additional muscle mass gives you a lot more flexibility from a dietary standpoint and helps with weight maintenance long term. Uh, so the more you can uh, integrate in physical activity, the National Weight Control Registry has actually shown that those who are able to lose a large amount of weight and keep it off long term, less than one percent of them are able to do it without having high levels of physical activity throughout the week. Um, and on average, they report exercising five to seven days per week, 30 to 60 minutes each bout. Uh, so for that, we know that exercise is really key for that weight maintenance. Absolutely. One of the um, things yes, recognize please. also is as we start to increase our intensity of our workouts, we need to increase our daily protein intake because as we break down our muscles with exercise, we have to rebuild them and make them bigger. If we're not getting enough protein, it's wasted effort. So, yeah. you know, when we talk about that 60, 70, 80 gram of protein per day, the general rule is for a sedentary individual, you need one calorie per kilogram of lean body mass. So that means someone whose lean body ideal weights about 140, 150 needs about 70, 75 grams of protein a day. If you're exercising modestly, you need about 1.2 to 1.25 grams of protein per kilogram per day. But if you're really going hardcore training for triathlons and things like that, you probably need closer to a gram and a half per kilogram lean body mass per day. Yeah. And the timing is also very important with that. Absolutely. Um, so all of this to point out, right, if bodybuilding or muscle building weren't so hard, it wouldn't be a sport. Uh, pick up the phone, call a dietitian. That's what we're here for, right? Uh, we, we we're here to help you uh, figure this out and navigate it. Uh, so rapid fire questions for you here, Dr. Shirk. They're, they're yeah. relatively straightforward and I have a feeling, I, uh, based on a few other answers here, I know what this next answer is gonna be. How long does it actually take to perform a sleep gastrectomy on average? Depends on the surgeon, depends on the place, depends on whether it's laparoscopic or robotic. 
It could be anywhere from about 35, 40 minutes up to about an hour, hour and a half. All right. And how does that compare to a gastric bypass? Gastric bypass is about 50 to 100 percent longer. So if the sleeve is being done in about an hour, a gastric bypass is going to be about an hour and a half. All right, excellent. And this might, this one might be a little bit more lengthy of an answer. What are some of the general garments that individuals can expect for after surgery or to prepare beforehand of abdominal binders, certain shirts or pants? Like, are there certain things that patients say they really prefer for, for after surgery that people can prepare for? Whatever you want. Um, the key is, you know, you're having surgery on your belly. We're going into your belly. We're, we're inflating your belly with carbon dioxide gas. Most of that is vented out at the end of the procedure, but some of it is absorbed into the, into the intestines, so you're going to be a little bit more bloated and distended. Your belly is going to be sore because even though it's less painful, it's not pain-free. The key is you don't want to wear your skinny jeans to the hospital because you're not going to want to wear them going home. So bring comfortable, looser-fitting clothes. The key is you want to be comfortable. And whatever that translates to, to is, is okay with us. All right, excellent. So let's talk about something that's short term and long term to wrap up for tonight. We have an anonymous question here asking about the effects of ghrelin, uh, uh, the effects on ghrelin sleep gastrectomy has. It's pretty much the same as gastric bypass, and nobody knows what ghrelin is. We know that ghrelin levels are associated with hunger. And when your ghrelin levels are high, you tend to be hungry. But if you give ghrelin to somebody who's not hungry, it doesn't make them hungry. It has something to do with appetite and hunger. But ghrelin levels are decreased after gastric bypass because the food doesn't go into the stomach. It go, the lower stomach it goes directly into the small intestine. With sleeve gastrectomy, it's believed that the reason the ghrelin levels are dropped is because we're cutting out the part of the stomach where ghrelin is made. So the answer is short and succinct. The ground levels are decreased with both operations. All right, excellent. Um, and I will add to that because, of course, as a dietitian, I can't talk about hunger without also talking about satiety. Uh, after surgery, we do expect ghrelin levels to decrease, as Dr. Shurik had mentioned, but we also typically expect satiety hormone production to change, too. So uh, certain studies uh, looking at 12 months and 18 months out from surgery, we see before surgery for many people, they have extreme hunger and then OK satiety, extreme hunger, OK satiety. We still see that of a little bit of hunger, okay satiety. A little bit of hunger, okay satiety. So for many people, they don't feel that level of uh, hormonal response that they're looking for many times after surgery. So it's actually two sides of the same coin for most individuals. Not everyone experiences this, uh, where they some people do find some level of satisfaction after surgery with food, but might not be at the level that we would be expecting given the lack of hunger, right? So it's it's a two-sided coin. So for many people, they, they report that they eat to live to an extent and that certain amounts of food are satisfactory for them um, and that they don't get the same uh, feeling afterwards. Dr. Shirk, you're nodding in, in, in agreement. Do you have any additional comments to add for, for satiety hormones as well? That's pretty much it, Colleen, right on.